This is a real story. It happened to me. I've never told anyone the full truth of that night, but I feel like I need to now. People have to know that some legends aren't just stories, they're warnings. I live in a small town, the kind of place where news travels fast, and everyone knows everyone else's business. It's quiet, tucked away from the chaos of the city, where life moves slower, and nothing out of the ordinary ever really happens. But there's a legend here, one that's been passed down for generations. They call it the Midnight Knock. Most folks just laugh it off, a ghost story to keep kids from staying out too late or to scare the superstitious. The story goes like this at exactly 3 a.m., there's a knock on your door. If you answer, you'll see a woman standing there. She's pale, dressed in tattered clothing, with eyes that seem to look right through you. She asks to come inside. No one knows why, but the legend says that if you let her in, you're dead by morning. No sign of struggle, no marks, nothing. Just a body found with a face frozen in pure terror. I didn't believe in any of that nonsense. I mean, who would? It's just a story. Or so I thought. It was late early spring, I think. The air still had a bite to it, and the wind rattled through the bare branches outside my house. My place isn't much, just a small, one-story house on the edge of town, surrounded by woods. I liked the isolation, the quiet. No neighbors to bother me, no noise to keep me up at night. It was just me, the trees, and the occasional sound of wildlife. That night, I'd fallen asleep on the couch, half watching some late night show on TV. I remember waking up to silence, the kind that feels heavy, like the air has thickened somehow. My eyes flicked to the clock on the wall, 2.47 a.m. I grumbled to myself, annoyed that I'd woken up so close to that dead zone of the night when it always feels like time stretches, like the world's holding its breath. I turned off the TV and got up to go to bed. That's when I heard at the knock. It wasn't loud, just a soft, deliberate knock at the front door. Three slow taps, evenly spaced. I froze. My first thought was that maybe someone had broken down on the road and needed help. But then I remembered the legend, that stupid, stupid story. I told myself it was nothing, just my imagination. I'm not some gullible fool who believes in ghosts. But the knocking came again. This time it was louder, more insistent. Three slow knocks, each one sending a chill down my spine. My heart started racing. I didn't want to look, but I had to. I grabbed my phone and opened the security camera app. I'd installed cameras around the house a few years ago after a break-in nearby. The live feed from the front porch flickered onto my screen, and I almost dropped the phone. There she was. A woman, standing right outside my door. She wasn't moving. Her face was pale, almost gray, and her clothes were torn and dirty, like she'd been wandering through the woods for days. Her hair hung in damp strands over her face, but I could see her eyes. They were wide, unblinking, staring straight at the door. Staring at me. I backed away from the door, my heart hammering in my chest. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It had to be a prank, right? Maybe one of the guys from work thought it'd be funny to mess with me. But then I remembered the legend the way they said she'd knock at exactly 3 a.m. I glanced at the clock again. 2.58 a.m. I'm not ashamed to admit I was scared. I stood there in the middle of my living room, not knowing what to do. Should I call the police? Tell them what that there's a ghost woman knocking on my door. They'd think I'd lost my mind. The knocking came again, harder this time. The sound echoed through the house, and I felt the floor beneath my feet vibrate. She was getting more insistent. My hands were shaking as I looked at the security feed again. She hadn't moved. She was still just standing there waiting. But her head, her head was tilted slightly now, like she knew I was watching her, like she could feel my fear through the camera. The light on the porch flickered, casting strange shadows on her face, then, without warning, she turned her head toward the camera, and her eyes locked onto mine through the screen. My blood went cold. There was no way she could see me. The camera was hidden, mounted high in the corner of the porch. But it felt like she was staring right into my soul. I dropped the phone, my breathing rapid, my body frozen. The clock ticked over to 3 a.m., 
and the knock stopped. Silence fell over the house like a blanket, thick and suffocating. For a moment I thought it was over. Maybe she had left. Maybe it was just some crazy person after all. Then I heard it the scratching. It was faint at first, like nails dragging slowly across wood. It came from the windows first on one side of the house, then the other. The sound was moving, circling me. I grabbed the phone from the floor and checked the other cameras. She wasn't on the porch anymore. I cycled through the feeds, checking the side yard, the back door. Nothing. But the scratching continued, moving from window to window, like she was searching for a way in. I grabbed a kitchen knife, holding it in front of me like it could protect me from whatever was outside. My hands were slick with sweat, my mind racing. How was this happening? It couldn't be real. It couldn't be. The scratching stopped. I stood there, every muscle in my body tensed, waiting for the next sound. But it didn't come. The house was silent again, the kind of silence that presses in from all sides, making you hyper-aware of every little noise. I glanced at the clock. 3.07 a.m. The legend said nothing about what happens after 3 a.m. if you don't answer the door. I started to relax, just a little, thinking maybe it was over. Maybe the story was just that a story. But then I heard the soft creak of the floorboards from inside the house. My blood turned to ice. I slowly turned toward the hallway, the knife trembling in my hand. There, in the dark, I could just make out the faint outline of a figure standing at the end of the hall. She was inside. Somehow, she'd gotten in. I didn't move. I couldn't. My body wouldn't listen to my brain. The figure started to walk toward me, her steps slow and deliberate, her bare feet making no sound on the wooden floor. She didn't speak. She didn't make a sound at all, just moved closer, her face still hidden in shadow. I backed up, trying to put distance between us, but I stumbled over the coffee table and fell to the floor. The knife skittered out of my hand, useless. I scrambled backward, my heart pounding so hard it hurt. She was right in front of me now, towering over me. I could see her face clearly in the dim light. Her skin was pale and stretched tight over her bones, her lips cracked and dry. But her eyes, her eyes were the worst part. They were wide and empty, dark hollows that seemed to go on forever. She knelt down slowly, her head tilting to one side as she reached out a hand toward me. Her fingers were long, too long, and they moved with a strange fluidity, like they weren't attached to her bones. I wanted to scream, to run, but my body wouldn't move. I was paralyzed with fear. Her hand hovered just inches from my face when suddenly she stopped. She stayed like that for what felt like an eternity, her empty eyes locked onto mine. Then, without warning, she stood up and backed away, retreating into the shadows of the hallway. I didn't dare follow her. I lay there on the floor, shaking, for what must have been hours. When the first light of dawn broke through the windows, I finally gathered the courage to get up. The house was empty. She was gone. I left that house the same day, packed a bag, got in my truck, and drove until I couldn't drive anymore. I didn't care where I ended up, as long as it was far away from that place. I don't know what she was, or why she came to my door. But I do know this, that legend wasn't just a story. It's real. And if you ever hear a knock at your door at 3 a.m., don't answer it. Don't even look. Just pray that whoever or whatever is on the other side goes away. Because if she doesn't, you won't be around to tell the tale. It was the fall of 2006, and I was driving home from my sister's place in western Pennsylvania. The highway stretched on for miles, empty and dark, lit only by the occasional streetlight and the faint glow of my headlights. It was late, much later than I had planned to be out, and the drive home was long and lonely. I'd done this route plenty of times before, and I knew every bend, every twist in the road. But something felt different that night, though I couldn't quite put my finger on why. The air seemed heavy, thicker than usual, and the silence inside the car was almost oppressive. It must have been close to midnight when I first saw the car. I was about 20 miles outside of town, 
deep in a stretch of highway that barely anyone used after dark. The road was narrow and winding, with nothing but woods on either side, the trees pressing in close like they were trying to swallow the asphalt. As I rounded a bend, my headlights flashed across a set of hazard lights blinking ahead on the shoulder. The car was sitting there, just off the road, its back end angled awkwardly toward the ditch. I slowed down, instinct kicking in. The hazard lights blinked rhythmically, casting a faint orange glow into the surrounding darkness. There was something off about the whole scene, but I couldn't quite place what it was. Maybe it was the fact that the car was still running, its engine idling softly, but there was no one around, no one standing by the car, no movement in the shadows. Just the soft hum of the engine and the steady flicker of the lights. I pulled over a few feet in front of the car, leaving my own engine running. I don't know why I did it, maybe I thought someone might need help, or maybe it was just instinct. I've heard stories about people doing dangerous things on empty roads, but this didn't feel like that. It felt... strange. Off. I stepped out of my car, the night air biting at my skin as I approached the vehicle. The engine was still warm, I could feel it radiating heat as I stood beside the hood, but there was no sign of anyone. The driver's side door was open just a crack, the interior light dimly illuminating an empty seat. The car was completely deserted, like whoever had been driving it had just vanished mid-journey. I felt a chill crawl up my spine, a sense of unease growing in the pit of my stomach. I peered into the car, half expecting to see someone crouch down or slumped over, but there was nothing. The seats were empty, the radio was off, and the keys were still in the ignition. There was no sign of a struggle, no bags or personal belongings lying around. Just an empty car on the side of a dark road, the hazard lights blinking like a warning. I stepped back, my heart racing a little faster now. Something was wrong. I knew I should call for help, maybe the police, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. I glanced back toward my own car, and that's when I saw it. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of movement a figure, barely visible, stepping out from the tree line behind my car. My breath caught in my throat, and I froze, staring at the mirror, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. The figure was tall, its outline shadowy and indistinct, moving slowly toward my car. At first, I thought it might be the driver, but something about the way it moved wasn't right. It was too slow, too deliberate, like it wasn't walking at all but gliding across the ground. Panic hit me like a punch to the gut. I turned and bolted back to my car, my heart hammering in my chest. As I yanked the door open and threw myself into the driver's seat, I glanced up at the mirror again. The figure was closer now, almost at the edge of my taillights, its face still obscured in shadow. I didn't wait to see more. I jammed the car into drive and slammed my foot on the gas, peeling out onto the road and speeding away as fast as I could. For a moment I thought I was in the clear. The car roared down the empty highway, the trees blurring past on either side. But then I glanced in the rearview mirror again, and my blood ran cold. The figure was still there, standing in the middle of the road where I had just been, but it was different now, closer. Somehow impossibly closer. No matter how fast I drove it seemed to be gaining on me, moving toward the car with that same slow, unnatural glide. I kept my eyes on the road, trying to focus, trying to convince myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But every time I looked in the mirror, the figure was closer, its outline becoming clearer, more defined. It was wearing dark clothes, a long coat or maybe a jacket, but its face, its face was wrong. It wasn't there. It was like looking at a blank slate, no features, no expression, just a void where a face should be. And yet, I could feel its gaze, cold and piercing, locked onto me. I drove faster, my hands white knuckling the steering wheel, my foot pressed to the floor. The car's engine whined under the strain, but no matter how fast I went, the figure kept appearing, inching closer and closer in the mirror. Suddenly, the radio crackled to life, a burst of static filling the car. The noise was deafening, sharp and grating, like nails on a chalkboard. I reached for the dial, trying to turn it off, but the static only grew louder, drowning out everything else. And through the static, I could hear something else voices, faint and distorted, like they were coming from far away. 
I couldn't make out the words, but they were there, whispering, calling. I gripped the steering wheel tighter, my breath coming in shallow gasps. The figure was almost at the back of the car now, its featureless face staring back at me through the mirror, just inches away. I couldn't take it anymore. I swerved the car off the road, tires screeching as I pulled onto the shoulder, the engine sputtering to a stop. The static cut out instantly, leaving a heavy, oppressive silence in its wake. I sat there, hands trembling, trying to catch my breath. The road was empty again. The figure was gone. I didn't move for what felt like hours, my eyes fixed on the rearview mirror, half expecting to see it reappear at any moment. But nothing happened. The road stretched out behind me, empty and still, as if nothing had ever been there at all. When I finally worked up the nerve to start the car again, I drove home as fast as I could. I didn't stop, didn't look back. The figure, the voices, the car on the side of the road I left it all behind, not daring to think about what had really happened. It wasn't until a few days later that I heard about the others. People had been seeing things on that stretch of road for years, always late at night, always under the same strange circumstances. Drivers would spot a car on the side of the road, its hazard lights blinking, and when they stopped to help, they'd encounter the figure. Sometimes it would be standing by the car, sometimes it would appear in the mirror, just like it had with me. But it always ended the same way with the figure getting closer, no matter how fast they drove, no matter how far they ran. And then there was the disappearance. 20 years ago, a man had vanished on that road. His car had been found on the shoulder, still running, hazard lights blinking but he was gone. No sign of him, no clues, nothing. They searched for weeks, combing the woods, the surrounding area, but it was like he had just disappeared. The only thing anyone ever found was his car, sitting there, waiting. I don't drive that road anymore. I take the long way home, even if it adds hours to my trip, because I know what I saw, and I know it's still out there, waiting for someone else to stop, waiting for the next driver to pull over and see those blinking lights. It was 2019 when we moved into the house. It wasn't supposed to be anything more than a fresh start, a small place on the edge of town, perfect for me and Emily. We were excited, full of optimism about what the new place would bring. The house was old, but solid. Brick exterior, a wide front porch, and enough space for the two of us to finally feel like we had our own corner of the world. It had sat empty for a while, but we didn't think much of it. In hindsight, that should have been the first red flag. The first few weeks were quiet, normal even. We spent our time unpacking, settling in, and trying to make the place feel like ours. It was the middle of summer, and the long days made the house feel warm, almost inviting. But as the days grew shorter and the evenings got darker, the atmosphere in the house began to change. I didn't notice it at first, not really. Just little things a draft where there shouldn't have been one. A strange sense of being watched when I was home alone. The first night I heard the whispers was about a month after we moved in. It was late, past midnight, and I was lying in bed, half asleep. Emily had already drifted off beside me. That's when I heard it a faint, almost imperceptible murmur coming from somewhere in the house. I thought it was just the house settling, the wind moving through the old pipes. I listened for a few seconds, waiting for it to stop, and when it didn't, I got up to investigate. I walked through the house, checking every room, but there was nothing. The sound had stopped as soon as I left the bedroom. I brushed it off as nothing, convinced myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me, and went back to bed. A few nights later, the whispers returned. This time, they were louder, more distinct, but still too muffled to make out any actual words. It was like they were coming from behind the walls, faint but constant. I lay there in bed, staring at the ceiling, straining to hear them, trying to convince myself it was just the house, or the wind, or anything but what it sounded like. But the whispers didn't stop. They seemed to ebb and flow, like a conversation happening just out of earshot, too soft to understand, but loud enough to notice. When I mentioned it to Emily the next morning, she shrugged it off. She hadn't heard anything. She said it was probably just the old pipes, like I had first thought but I could tell by the look in her eyes that she was unsettled. Something wasn't right. 
As the days passed, the whispers grew more frequent. I'd hear them late at night, always when the house was quiet and still, when there was no other noise to cover them up. And it wasn't just me. Emily started hearing them too. At first she tried to deny it, said it was just her imagination, but I could see the fear growing in her as the whispers grew louder. They weren't just random sounds anymore. They were calling our names. It started faintly, almost like a soft hum. I would lie in bed and hear Jack whispered from somewhere in the house. Emily heard her name too. We tried to convince ourselves it was nothing, that we were just hearing things. But deep down, we both knew something was terribly wrong. I began to notice other things as well. I'd be sitting in the living room, watching TV, and I'd catch movement out of the corner of my eye. A shadow darting past the doorway, just out of sight. The feeling of being watched became constant. It was like there was someone or something in the house with us, watching from the shadows, waiting. The air in the house felt different, heavier, like it was pressing down on us. One night, after a particularly bad episode of The Whispers, I decided to check the attic. We hadn't spent much time up there since moving in, mostly because it was cramped and musty, filled with old furniture and forgotten junk from the previous owners. But something about that night drove me to explore it. Maybe I thought I'd find an explanation, some logical reason for what was happening. The attic was dusty, filled with cobwebs and the smell of decay. I rummaged through old boxes, moving aside what seemed like decades of forgotten belongings, when I found something strange. Hidden under a pile of old clothes, I discovered a small stack of letters, yellowed with age. The paper was brittle, the ink faded, but the writing was still legible. The letters were written by the previous owners of the house a couple, just like us. As I read through them, a sinking feeling of dread crept over me. The letters described the same things we were experiencing the whispers, the feeling of being watched, the strange sounds coming from the walls. The couple had tried to ignore it at first, but over time the whispers became more aggressive, more threatening. They had even started seeing shadowy figures, just like we had. The final letter was the worst. It was scrawled hastily, almost illegible, as if it had been written in a hurry. The writer spoke of a presence in the house, something evil that wouldn't leave them alone. They mentioned a murder, something that had happened in the house years before they had moved in. A woman had been killed, her body buried beneath the floorboards. Her spirit, they believed, was still trapped in the house, trying to communicate, trying to get out. The couple left the house shortly after that final letter. No forwarding address, no trace of them. They had disappeared, just like they had written they would. I didn't know what to think after reading those letters. My rational mind wanted to reject it to find some logical explanation. But deep down, I knew the truth. The house was haunted. The whispers weren't just the sounds of an old building settling. They were real. After finding the letters, things escalated quickly. The whispers were no longer confined to the night. We heard them during the day now, soft at first, but growing louder, more insistent. We could hear them in every room, calling our names, beckoning us to listen. And then, they started threatening us. I'd hear my name, followed by a voice whispering terrible things. Threats, curses, promises of violence. Emily heard the same. The feeling of being watched had become unbearable. We couldn't sleep. Every time we closed our eyes, we'd feel the presence in the room, watching, waiting for us to let our guard down. Then, one night we saw it. It was late, maybe two in the morning, and we were both wide awake, lying in bed. The whispers had been relentless that night, louder than ever before. Suddenly, the room grew cold, colder than I'd ever felt. The air turned sharp, and that's when we saw it a shadow, standing at the foot of the bed. It was tall, its form hunched and twisted, its face obscured by the darkness. But we could feel it staring at us, feel its hatred radiating through the room. I couldn't move, couldn't speak. I just stared at it, frozen with fear. Emily was beside me, clutching the blanket, her eyes wide with terror. The shadow didn't move, didn't speak. It just stood there, watching us, its presence filling the room with a suffocating darkness. After what felt like hours, the shadow slowly faded away, leaving us in silence. But the cold remained, and the whispers continued, softer now, but more threatening. 
I knew then that we couldn't stay in the house any longer. The next morning, we packed up and left. We didn't tell anyone what had happened. Who would believe us? We just left the house, locked the door, and drove away, hoping to leave the whispers behind. But I can still hear them, 